In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today is the day, May the 6th. Here in England, close to the border of Wales, today is actually the day that St. John the Evangelist, the Apostle, after our Lord had ascended into heaven, and by this time Our Lady was already assumed into heaven, St. John was arrested, he was taken in Rome before the Latin Gate. And there's a church there that you can pray at where the actual site took place where St. John was lowered in boiling oil. And that was to be his martyrdom, his death. And he came out younger and stronger. And the mother, the gospel is, shows the mother of Zebedee this woman is great because she's going to be very faithful to Christ. She's going to be at the foot of the cross. She's going to be burying Christ's body with the Virgin Mary. She'll be one of the Marys to come to the tomb of our Lord and witness his resurrection. And our Lord will appear to her and Mary of Salome on their way back from the tomb. So it's a very chosen soul. It's a very beautiful soul. And she's very... She's very confident because she comes to our Lord and says, I want my, my two sons to sit next to you in the kingdom of heaven. So imagine the boldness of this mother. But Christ doesn't rebuke her. And his answer is, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the chalice which I am going to drink? And he says this to St. To John and St. James, their brothers, the Zebedee brothers. And their answer is, Posimus, yes, of course we can. <laughs> they don't realize what they're saying. That they're going to, but they will drink the chalice. And the chalice is their martyrdom. So St. James will be martyred uh, by being, St. James the Greater, by being beaten to death. And St. John will not physically die a martyr, but today would have been his martyrdom. May the 6th, when he was boiling oil. But uh, the, uh, our Lord, as he said, <clears throat> John will remain. I have work for John to do, he told St. Peter. And that work, when he comes out of the boiling oil, he's younger and stronger than before. So they see this miracle, and they just exile him out to the island of Patmos. And you can see that cave. I've never been there, but you can see um, those who have... The videos of the beautiful island of Patmos in the cave where St. John lived. And there's actually a, a church there. You could have mass and everything. And that's where St. John wrote the Apocalypse. So St. John saw the era of the Antichrist, the great beast rising out of the sea, the dragon with the seven heads and ten horns, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. All those visions of the Apocalypse he saw on the island of Patmos. So he would live a ripe old age into his almost 100 years old. St. John was known in his old age to be repeating constantly in his sermons, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. And this has to be the mark of the true children of God, of the children of the faith, of the Catholic faith, to love one another. And the true love is firstly to love what's best for our souls. So true love is to guide the soul to heaven and not to commend them and not to pat them on the back in a life of sin. Today, that's what many people think, is to, to be charitable, is to say, yeah, okay, you can divorce and not say anything that, hey, this goes against God's law and to support them in their sin. The Holy Ghost says, woe to those, especially priests, who put elbows under the life of sinners. They will require their blood at their judgment. So the priest has to, has to, their duty is to warn against especially heresy and error and what goes against the faith. And that's why most priests are not, who are of tradition, are not very popular. And most bishops who are not uh, going with the Vatican II religion are not popular. 
One of them, of course, was Archbishop Lefebvre. And how well applies these words in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 5. We were esteemed as insane, insensati. Their life was estimated or held in esteem as, as insensati and insaniam, which is uh, just basically an insane life. And it's true. You're married and, and take the children God sends you, you're crazy. You stand up for the truth and oppose the modern errors, you're nuts. You oppose the whole way of the modern world, which is one of vice and sin and all the promotion of vice. You are out of, people are losing their jobs for this. I've already known a few who have lost their good jobs simply because they stated the truth that this goes against the law of God and they were fired. One man uh, in New York, big family, he was an engineer on airplanes. The whole group of them were in favor of the, the horrible rainbow flag laws that were being passed in New York. And uh, the boss and some of the friends at lunch break asked him, so what do you think of this law? Don't you think it's great? He says, no, I oppose it. That's all he said. I don't agree with it. I oppose it. And he was fired within a week. So their life is considered insane. And that's where the St. John stood at the foot of the cross with the Virgin Mary. Who was considered insane that day? Those who stood at the foot of the cross. So in this day, we have to stand there. And it's better to be estimated as crazy and insane in, in the world's eyes but rooted in the truth in God's eyes. So let me just again uh, add a nauseam. I'm going to keep repeating these great quotes. I have a whole collection of Archbishop Lefebvre on subjects of the New Mass, Vatican II, obedience, sedificantism, uh, the modern orientation, etc. So let me just pick up, because uh, on this Mass Circuit tour through England and Australia, this is what I'm going to be doing, is reminding things, quotes of Archbishop Lefebvre that myself and all of us need to be reminded because he really understood this fight we're in. And if we don't fight for this, we're going to slide. With modernism, if you don't fight this beast, it devours you. This is an interview of Archbishop Lefebvre in Fidelitor magazine, this is shortly before his death in March in 1991, January 1991. Fidelitor magazine asked him, but there are traditionalists who have made an agreement with Rome without conceding anything. In other words, well, they were accepted as they are, how come you can't do this either? Archbishop Lefebvre, that is false. They have waived their opportunity to oppose Rome. They must remain silent because of the favors they have been granted. Then they start to slip ever so slowly until they end up admitting the errors of Vatican II. It is very dangerous a situation. Such concessions by Rome aim only to get the break the division with the Society of St. Pius X traditionalists and submit to Rome. Uh, I know one of the priests who uh, was in a cone in 1985-86 and Cardinal Ratzinger contacted some seminarians right under the nose of Archbishop Lefebvre and promised this group of seminarians, look, we'll give you recognition, we'll give you a seminary, you can have the traditional mass, and he succeeded to bring out a, fact, a fraction of the seminarians to follow this promise. And it, it soon it fizzled out. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he could see what Cardinal Ratzinger was up to, trying to divide the tradi traditionalists. Archbishop Lefebvre, interview with Fidelity Magazine, 1988. Supposing that Rome calls for a new, renewed dialogue, then I will put the conditions. 
I shall not accept being in the position I was put in during the dialogue, the, the discussions. No more. I will place this discussion at the doctrinal level. And I will ask Rome, do you agree with the great encyclicals of all the popes who preceded you? Do you agree with Quanta Cura of Pius IX, Immortali Dei and Libertas of Leo XIII, Pascendi Gregis of Pius X, Quas Primas of Pius XI, Humani Generis of Pius XII? Are you in full communion with the popes and their teachings? Do you still accept the entire anti-modernist oath? Are you in favor of the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you do not accept the doctrine of your predecessors, it is useless to talk. As long as you do not accept the correction of the council in consideration of the doctrine of these popes, your predecessors, no dialogue is possible. It is useless. Thus, the positions will be clear. So the argument that's being passed around now is Archbishop Lefebvre was open to discussions. He was open for the tradition to be an experiment. Let, let tradition have the experiment. But that was in the early stages of the discussions of Rome. There's three stages. The early discussions where he hoped to convert Rome to tradition. The second stage where he realizes Rome is not interested in tradition. Third stage, this one. No more discussion. If Rome wants to talk, I will ask them, do you even have the Catholic faith? And if you don't, no discussion. We carry on until Rome comes back to the Catholic faith. Next one. Archbishop Lefebvre, this is his ordination sermon, 1989, in, uh, of his 60th anniversary of his ordination. We must build against Excuse me. We must build again the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian world which is disappearing. But you shall say to me, but, but your excellency, this is the fight of David against Goliath. Yes, indeed, I know. But in his fight against Goliath, David won the victory. How did he win the victory? By a little stone which he took from the torrent what is this little stone which we have? Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall say with our ancestors from the Vendée, we have no other honor than the honor of Jesus Christ. We have no other fear in the world than to offend Jesus Christ. They went to their death to defend their God singing this. We also let us sing with courage wholeheartedly we have no other love than our Lord Jesus Christ, no other fear than to offend him. And you can bet when St. John was being boiled in oil, as he was being descended into that uh, oil, these very thoughts were in his heart and mind. We have no other love than our Lord Jesus Christ, no other fear than to offend him. And then the last two, let's see, four more quotes here. Do not be surprised, Archbishop of Fev says, this is 1988, do not be surprised if we do not come to an understanding with Rome. This is not possible while Rome will not return to the faith in the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. We collided on a point of the Catholic faith. Same interview, 1988. We want to remain united to Jesus Christ as the Vatican has dethroned the Lord. We want to remain faithful to our Lord, King, Prince, and Ruler of the world. We cannot change anything in this line of conduct. <clears throat> and so he saw, dealing with modernist Rome, they, they, they make us change. All the groups who have gone with modernist Rome, they have all changed their positions including the new SSPX, sad to say. It had to take all the frenzy of the enemies of Jesus Christ to bring them to the point of tearing away our Lord's crown. When an application of the Council of 1962, the innovators suppressed these three strophes of the hymn from the Vespers of Christ the King. And here I'll read them now. 
the three verses out of this magnificent hymn of Vespers to Christ the King. Here's the three verses they deleted. The wicked mob screams out, we don't want Christ as King, while we with shouts of joy hail thee as the world's supreme King. May the rulers of the world publicly honor and extol thee. May the teachers and judges reverence thee. May the laws express thy order and the arts reflect thy beauty. May kings find renown in their submission and dedication to thee. Bring under thy gentle rule our country and our homes. And that was deleted. Imagine this being sung in Parliament someday and in the White House. Someday it will. That's prophesied. The last two quotes taken from They Have Uncrowned Him. At the risk of repeating myself, I come back to the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That dogma of the Catholic faith, and in the original this is italicized, that dogma of the Catholic faith, which no one can put into doubt without being a heretic. Yes, exactly, a heretic, to deny the reign of Christ the King over England, over the United States, over all political governments. And lastly, so it is essential for us to have the conviction of this truth of faith. Everything, including civil society, has been devised to serve directly or indirectly the redeeming plan of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this was the insistence of Father Dennis Fahey, uh, who, lived, who died in, um, just before the council, but his insistence on the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we Catholics got to fight for. And this is our plan of action. It's very simple. The reign of Christ over England, over all countries, over our families and societies. So look at St. John boiling in oil. Look at him in the island of Patmos. Look at him dying, the last of the apostles. And with his death ended public revelation. That means everything from Adam and Eve to the death of St. John, all that was public revelation. No pope, no council, nobody has the right to change this or add to it or subtract from it. And, Saint, and it was St. John who said in his, his epistle, anyone who dissolves Jesus Christ is of the spirit of the Antichrist. Vatican II absolutely dissolves Jesus Christ. The new mass dissolves Jesus Christ. So anything that dissolves Jesus Christ is of the spirit of the Antichrist. And that's why it's true to say Vatican II, the new mass, and all its reforms, which are still heavily impacting the whole world, even this town with the local church still has that new mass, taking misleading many souls. It dissolves Jesus Christ. It's of the spirit of the Antichrist. Why? Because it's preparing for the Antichrist. Dissolving Catholics from the faith, making them lose the faith, accepting this one world religion, ecumenism, and they're ripe and ready for the Antichrist. So we have to stand opposed to this. And God put us in this time, and like St. John being preserved, God will preserve you if he wants, and keep you strong if you persevere and stay close to the mother of God. So let's pray to her for the strength, like St. John, to stand with her at the foot of the cross. But St. John did lose the faith at the foot of the cross. He did. He, didn't, he stopped believing that Christ was God. But the Virgin Mary never did. She didn't lose the faith. She knew he was God. She knew he would rise from the dead. She didn't know exactly how, but she knew. So let's not just stand by her, Let's get under her mantle and stay close and wrapped in her mantle. And you are if you wear her scapular and you pray her rosary. May she always hold you strong in the faith that we come to see her and the Blessed Trinity and St. John and all the saints in heaven someday. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.